Hello, my fellow project managers. It's your friend Phil here, project management trainer and coach. Welcome to 30 Power Tools for Smart Project Management. I've been training a course over the past number of years called Smart Project Management, and I've found these 30 tools to be extremely helpful to companies worldwide. I'll be sharing some of those with you. If you take a close look at the screen, you can see those are my credentials. I've got various project management certifications in the project management professional, and also the Agile Certified Practitioner certifications, Prince2, the risk management professional, Microsoft Project, MCTS, and many more. The next slide shows you some of the firms I've trained worldwide. You might identify some of these. Let's get straight into the first tool. Now, let me clarify that in the world of the PMI, they do not call these tools. But in the general sense of project management, I look at these as tools in the project manager's toolkit for them to use as needed. So this first one is the business case. The business case is talked about very heavily in the PMBOK guide. And the business case makes a case for the project. That's pretty much what it does. And I'm gonna show you a sample of a business case that exists from the Center for Disease Control and Prevention. In fact, I will be sharing with you a lot of their templates that are out there. I would advise that you check the link below and download those that are of interest to you. And there you can see it from the CDC's website, a light version of a business case. Now the business case, like I said, makes a case for the project. In fact, the PMI call this an economic feasibility study because it shows you the viability and sensibility of the project. If you take a look at this template they have here, you can see the executive summary and introduction, and then it goes into general investment information, the project description or proposed project description, if you will, high level business impact, how will it impact the business, and an alternatives analysis to take a look at the various options that you could use to get this job done. Remember, the business case is gonna show you why you are choosing this project and how you're gonna get from your current state to your future state. The preferred solution after the alternatives analysis is also documented here. So this is a pretty neat document for any project manager that really wants to help his or her organization better initiate projects so that when projects are initiated, it's done based on a thorough economic feasibility study. Now let's take a look at our next document. It's called a benefits management plan. The benefits management plan is talked about quite a lot in the PMBOK guide. I'm gonna show you a sample of this document, but before I do, why don't we talk about it just a little. And reading from the PMBOK guide on page 33, by the way, this is what the PMBOK guide looks like. It states here, the project benefits management plan is the document that describes how and when the benefits of the project will be delivered and describes the mechanisms that should be in place to measure those benefits. So the key thing is, you know there are benefits to be gained from the project, what are they? When are they gonna be realized? Who is responsible for realizing them? And a lot more information. Here we have certain bullets, target benefits, strategic alignment, time frame for realizing the benefits. Who is the benefits owner? Which metrics will we use to measure those benefits? What are the assumptions regarding these benefits? And are there any risks regarding the realization of these benefits? This is a very important document that project managers should actually push because this is relatively new to many firms. It's one thing to have a project management plan, but it's another thing to have a benefits management plan to ensure that the benefits of the project were indeed realized. So this is on page 33 in this version of the PMBOK guide. Now let's take a look at the benefits management plan. Now on the screen, you can see an example of a benefits management plan from the Health Support Services. And it's a very basic, straight up plan. You can see the phases regarding benefits management have been identified, 
reconcile the business case benefit. So whatever was realized in the business case or discussed, this needs to be reconciled with these actual benefits that we're documenting as what we seek to gain from the project. Secure benefit ownership, who's gonna own the benefit to make sure it is accounted for and realized. Develop benefits activity plan, conduct baseline measures. In other words, measure those benefits to ensure that they are being realized. Review business change, if any, go live activities and benefits tracking. So when we talk about reviewing business change, we hope for change. Change is not bad, change is good. So this benefits management plan is gonna help us keep track of the benefits and hopefully get to that place where our benefits are realized. If our benefits have not been realized, then we need to ask why, what happened? And that's where project management continues to probe how can we better do things? How can we better realize our benefits? So that is the second power tool. And the reason why I consider it so is because a lot of times projects are authorized, but the benefits of those projects are never realized in full. This is where the project manager can shine. Let's take a look at our next power tool in our toolbox. Our next power tool in our toolbox is none other than a popular document, which is known as the project charter. In fact, if you are a student of project management, you hear various allotropes, various similar documents being spoken about. The project charter is also referred to in some circles as a PID, a project initiation document. But the bottom line about a charter is it authorizes the project, it puts the project manager and the sponsor, as well as other stakeholders on the same page. So it is a rather useful document in project management. We're talking about authorization, direction, and high level detail, just enough detail to kick the project off, to get rolling along, to move into the initiation processes, and to fuel other planning processes with enough information to be able to sensibly plan the project. So let me show you an example of a charter from the Center for Disease Control and Prevention. So you can see on the screen here, an example of a project charter from the Center for Disease Control and Prevention. It has been rather well put together with lots of references to details in the PMBOK guide. When you take a look at the project charter, it sucks information from various sources, especially the business case and the contract if there is one, but it takes this information into it. So you have things such as the justification of the project, the business impact, strategic alignment, high-level scope, high-level schedule, key milestones, high-level budget estimates, high-level alternative analysis, assumptions, constraints, and risks at a high level, and other high-level information. There is no hard and fast rule about how a project charter can look in fact, there are various examples of project charters in popular space. I'll show you another example of a project charter from a backpack project. This is a fictitious charter that was put together by a team member of mine. And let me show that to you. Take a look. And you can see on the screen yet another version of the charter. This was done in Excel. You can see the project purpose or business case, project description, project and product requirements, acceptance criteria. One of the important things, very important things that should be in any charter is success criteria. Also we have in here, as you can see, high level risks. There's the success criteria, scope, schedule, cost and quality at a high level, depending on how you want to customize it, 
But we don't want to get carried away here because we still have other documents where we can plan out in detail. So this is meant to be very high level. You can see on the screen, we've got a key stakeholder list. So this will not replace our stakeholder register, which I am yet to show you, but this is a high level list of stakeholders, just a list to let you know who's who. And that is the project charter. Again, a very, very useful project management tool, in my opinion. Let's go back to our slides and take a look at what's next. Next, we will be talking about the project management plan. So we've got a project management plan to show you from the Center for Disease Control and Prevention. But a key thing about this plan is it is the sum total of all subsidiary plans. When we say the subtotal of all subsidiary plans, we mean that several plans come together in the project management plan. Let's take a look at that. Here's our project management plan example from our friends at the CDC. Let's go straight to the table of contents. You can see there's an executive summary of the project charter that's optional. But the key thing is you're going to be capturing the key scope the schedule, the cost, the quality, how you're gonna manage resources, communications, risk, procurements, change, everything should be documented in this plan. And as you can see, they've broken it out into sections where relevant tables and details are. Now, for some projects, this could be a little bit much, or it could be a little bit much in the wrong direction. To be perfectly honest with you, some projects will not use this at all. They'll use other things and that's fine. But the reason why I'm showing you this is for you to have options. Some projects are better done fully plan driven. Some projects are better done fully change driven or agile. So bear in mind, I'm not showing you that this is a one time or single use tool for every project. No, that's not what I'm saying. I'm not saying that this is all you need for all your projects. I'm showing it to you as an option and you can scale this up or down. You don't have to use every single piece in that template. So that is the project management plan. Let's move on to our next document here. Our next document after the project management plan is the requirements traceability matrix. So let's take a look at the requirements traceability matrix. There's actually a pretty useful matrix that they have again on the Center for Disease Control and Prevention website. So let's check that out. Now, this is the CDC website and we're gonna click on this requirements traceability matrix. So let's download that and let's open it up and let's take a look. And there you have it. This is the requirements traceability matrix what is a requirements traceability matrix? It's a document that maps requirements to their origin. In other words, you could say it maps the requirement to the source of the requirement. Where is the requirement from? Who asked for it? This table is a really priceless table. It looks very simple, but when used, my goodness, it gives you such a massive payoff. I use this at a well-known firm to keep seven different stakeholders straight. And I had over 120 different requirements. The way I kept them straight was putting in the source. And by the way, I added that because that was not in the table initially. But who is the source? What is the technical assumption or customer need? What is the functional requirement? And you could keep track of status, you could also link that with any relevant architectural drawings for that requirement. 
whatever the requirement needs to be mapped to software module, system component, test case number. In fact, one of the things we did was link it to test scripts and use cases. So towards the end of the project, we would actually ensure that those requirements were indeed inherent in the software that we were working on. And we would actually get stakeholders to go through a validation process to check off and say, I asked for it and my requirement is deemed complete and inherent in the deliverable. So that's how you can use the requirements traceability matrix. There are various variations of it, but that's pretty much it in a nutshell. And let me show you just one more version of that requirements traceability matrix for good measure. Again, on our backpack project, which is a fictitious project my colleague and I put together, you can see he has included various requirements, priority, category, and many other fields that you saw in that one. We could also link the requirement to a specific WBS item if needed. The reason for doing this, because there's a reason for using each of these different tools. The reason for doing this is to keep your requirements straight, to make sure that everything that was a requirement has been tested and checked out in the final deliverable. So that's the requirements traceability matrix. Now, before going into our next tool, which has to do with requirements, I just wanna make a few things very clear because the aspect of gathering requirements should be looked at as a collaborative effort. So when I say collect requirements, gather requirements, at the heart of that is collaboration. And that is summed up in the word elicitation. So I'm gonna show you a few pieces of information regarding how these requirements could be elicited. So to do that, I'm gonna to refer to the PMI's business analysis areas of knowledge. So let's take a look at this really quick. The first one is needs assessment. There should be a needs assessment analyzing the current business problems or opportunities. Second, stakeholder engagement identifying and analyzing those who have an interest in the outcome of the solution. Next is elicitation itself, planning and preparing for elicitation. Next is the analysis, breaking down whatever has been gathered, clarifying it to better understand. Next is traceability and monitoring. I showed you the requirements traceability matrix. So in that line of traceability, there's also monitoring, like I said, at the end, you wanna make sure that you really did meet the mark and you wanna make sure those requirements were well managed throughout the process. And lastly, there's a solution evaluation. So there's quite a lot to be spoken about here, but we're gonna hone in on elicitation and the elicitation processes are one, determine your approach, two, prepare for the elicitation, three, conduct the elicitation, and four, confirm elicitation results. Now there's quite a lot to be spoken about in this area of elicitation, but I wanna just jump to some practical things that you can do and that you can use as you begin to elicit your requirements. Now there are three stages of elicitation. The first is introduction. This sets the pace and the tone. The second is the body where the questions are asked. And last but not least is the close. So as a project manager, you need to be aware of these and look for ways that you can maximize your elicitation. There's a rather important part of the PMBOK guide that I think may be useful to you, and that is called collaborative games. So collaborative games are a collection of elicitation techniques that foster collaboration. And to be honest, it just enables you to have all around great fun as you collect requirements. So I'm gonna show you these one by one really quick before we get to our next power tool. The first one is called Product Box. It's an elicitation techniques that use, uses gameplay to focus on the features of a product that are important to the customer. So a simple box, what are the features that jump out 
to the customer, they will let you know in designing a product box. The team uses colors, designs, and slogans to bring to the surface whatever they see as being very important in that product. The next one is Speedboat. It's an elicitation technique that uses gameplay to elicit information about product features that the customers or the stakeholders find problematic. So you can ask them to draw out a boat and anchors. Those anchors are meant to show things that are dragging the product, current product, back. So it's a chance for them to describe what the problems are on each anchor. Next one is spider web. It's an elicitation technique used to discover unknown relationships between the product being analyzed and other products. The technique is performed by drawing a circle in the middle of a large sheet to represent the product. Participants are given a few minutes to brainstorm other products that may be related in some way to the product listed. The spider web can be played using a variety of materials to symbolize the products and relationships. The use of different materials allows participants to show variances in importance or risk between different products and relationships. The next one is storyboarding. We all know what this is. It's a prototyping technique that shows sequence or navigation through a series of images or illustrations. Wireframes, also priceless. These are diagrams that represent a static blueprint or schematic of a user interface used to identify basic functionality, such as what you can see on the screen. The next one is an evolutionary. It's a prototype that is the actual finished solution in process. So instead of throwing away the prototype, as some projects do, this prototype is kept and refined until we get to the final end state. Prototyping, we all know what this is. Generally, the prototype has a point where it's thrown away or no longer used or considered. And this is what distinguishes prototyping from the evolutionary that we just saw. So folks, that is at a very high level, an idea of how you can use certain gameplay and methods to elicit your requirements. So I know I showed you the requirements traceability matrix, but there's a lot more under the surface of that. Now we're gonna take a look at yet another useful tool that is used in collecting requirements. And this tool that I'll show you, you might have heard of them. You might have heard of user stories. User stories are a great way, really, really awesome way of collecting requirements from stakeholders. I have seen these user stories actually work wonders on government projects, believe it or not. Projects that you would have considered to be fully plan driven, I have found user stories to be that magic bullet that silences doubt. Doubt about what the customer actually wants. So let me show you some of the logic and the thought process when you're creating these user stories. And there's your example of the user story. How is it written? It's written from the perspective of the user. For example, as a, whatever the role is, I can feature whatever that feature is so that reason. For example, as an account owner, I can check my balance online so that I can keep a daily balance 24 hours a day. Or as a doctor, I can check my patient's records online. So you can feel free to use site deviations from the template as a whatever the role is. I want whatever the feature is because whatever that reason is or whatever the rationale behind that request is, you see. So use variations of these, but I found these to be very, very helpful in clearing any misunderstanding regarding the requirement. It really brings it home and it helps those who are reading the requirement and about to act on it really understand why the user is asking for it. In other words, you could say it makes a stronger case 
for the requirement. Instead of just asking for requirement, the user is stating the why behind the requirement. And that could be very helpful. Now let's take a look at number seven. Number seven is the project scope statement. Now this has got to be one of the most underrated tools in the project manager's gig bag. A lot of people do not use a project scope statement. A lot of folks may not have even thought about a project scope statement. But the project scope statement is a document. I think of it as a special document because it fleshes out what has to be done in order to deliver that end result. Think about it. Whatever needs to be done to deliver the deliverable should be in your project scope statement. You might have heard the term inclusions or the term exclusions. When we talk about inclusions and exclusions, you hear the term inclusions and exclusions, you know immediately this is talking about the project scope statement. Now in the PMBOK guide, the particular process is called define scope. It sounds very ordinary, but it's really, really powerful in that you take your requirements, you begin to sift through your requirements, you examine your requirements. So requirements management does not end in collecting or eliciting requirements. It actually continues in this process that we know as defined scope. And in defined scope, we choose certain requirements that make their way to the final, you see, to the final set of requirements. And based on that final set of requirements, we then identify what needs to be done to deliver these requirements. You see, it's one thing to collect requirements, but you know, it's another thing to actually get those requirements done, isn't it? It's a, it's a totally different thing. So right now I'm gonna show you really quick what this looks like in the world of the PMI. So the process where this is done is known as defined scope and the output of defining scope, as I said, is a document that encapsulates the inclusions and the exclusions and the detailed deliverable description. Having all this information down is gonna help you plan out how to get to your end goal. Let me give you a very straight up example here. You might have heard of Andy George, he's got a channel on YouTube. He's got these videos, how to make everything. Well, he decided to make a chicken sandwich from scratch. And along those lines, I usually told my students before I saw his video, can you imagine being asked to make a chicken sandwich from scratch? So this was an interesting practical view of what I would tell my students. Can you imagine if a client wanted a stakeholder, wanted a sandwich from scratch? If the stakeholder wanted the sandwich from scratch, you would have had to do all these things that you see him doing in these pictures, growing the lettuce, getting the mayonnaise, going to the Atlantic for a trip to get salt water because the client wants everything from scratch. So can you imagine that? A client wanting a chicken sandwich as the deliverable from scratch. It would look mundane if someone said, take a trip to the Atlantic. But when you truly know what the requirements are, you then know, oh, this has to be part of the scope. You see, what am I trying to tell you? I'm trying to tell you that the requirements begets the scope. Requirement gives birth to scope. The customer saying they want this to look like that. They want everything from scratch. It begets scope. The client wants the letters from scratch, vegetable patch, additional scope. The client wants salt, but it has to be original, new, made from scratch, a trip to the Atlantic. You see what I'm saying? So as a result of the requirements, then comes the scope. And that is why this document that I'm showing you, the uh, project's uh, scope statement, 
is a very important one. Let me go back just so that we put a face to the name again. Um, here we go. This project scope statement is a much needed feature on many projects. Okay, so the project scope statement is going to help you keep the scope straight and it's going to help you identify what is included in the project and what is not. What does it look like? Here's an example of a scope statement. It's a very scrappy example. But if we zoom in here, you can see a few things that I'm showing you. Um, you can see it has um, the customer, the key stakeholders, a role in the project. At a high level, some of those requirements, some smart acceptance criteria, because the deliverable acceptance should actually be featured here. How do you know that the deliverable is accepted? You know, there's a difference between what we looked at first, the project charter that had success criteria versus deliverable acceptance criteria. And this is where you have the deliverable acceptance criteria. This is where you also take a look one more time at your assumptions and constraints, make sure that they're still straight. And what is not included in the project exclusions should also be featured here. So it's quite a lot of information, but if you go to the PMBOK guide 5.3, I believe it is, you'll be able to read a lot more about this document, which a lot of people neglect. Um, it's not on the CDC website, but I would highly recommend having a statement of the work that needs to be done to accomplish the end goal, the deliverable of the project. Let's move on to number eight, the work breakdown structure, the WBS. What is a WBS? Let's take a closer look at the work breakdown structure. Now, when you talk about a work breakdown structure, it's a hierarchical breakdown of the project work. This is what it looks like. It looks very similar to a family tree. At a glance, the WBS was developed by the US Defense Department in the late 1950s and by NASA in the early 1960s. Why do we need a WBS? because it helps project managers better plan. It helps us distinguish one project needs from another, and it enables a deeper understanding of the projects in the organization. I'm gonna show you an example of a WBS that has been around for a while. This is from the Department of Energy. They've got a pretty interesting WBS that is very easy to understand. And this is a work breakdown structure for building a house. You can see it starts at the root. We call it the root node. And then we begin breaking that down into lower levels. Sometimes at level two, we can have points in which management exerts certain control. Hence the term control accounts where these are concerned. And at the end of the day, it just helps you visualize what needs to be done and understand all the different parts of the project. I've used this at various firms, aerospace, healthcare, and I find out that the experts, even though they know what they need to do, when they see it in a work breakdown structure, it puts a lot more meaning, a lot more deliberateness and focus behind whatever they're trying to do. For the first time, they see it all come together as though they're seeing the project come together as one. So this is a very, very useful tool of project management. And I mean, you can have a WBS for all sorts of things. Here is one for a new toy. You see there are WBSs for anything you wanna do. The PMI actually has a document known as the WBS standard or the standard for WBS creation. So if you wanted to get more information about the WBS, that will be a good place to look. Now let's take a look at what our next tool is. Our next tool is the project schedule. Now, a schedule is pretty much a tabulated view of tasks or activities, their start and end date, their durations, and so on. In fact, this says a tabulated list of tasks with start and end dates, durations, milestones, 
and other data used to drive the project and keep the team on task. So in order to illustrate this, I should show you a schedule. So why don't we take a look at what a schedule looks like. Now to do this, I am gonna show you a schedule that was made in MS Project. Microsoft Project is a tool that a lot of project managers use, but it's not the only tool. There are many tools out here. So here is an example of a schedule. And this schedule once again was for a backpack project. And you can see what the schedule does. You've got the task name, you've got the duration, you've got the start, you've got the finish dates. And you also have in Microsoft Project other fields such as predecessor fields. You could actually go a step further and actually cost out your project using Microsoft Project as we have in the past. And resource names are also in there, successors and what have you. And there's the fancy Gantt chart on the right hand side. Now all of this can be scaled. I find this to be a very, very useful tool. It is very, very simple to use in my opinion. If someone wanted to put a schedule together, they open it up, make a few tweaks, like put that on auto scheduled, and off to the races it is, put in your tasks. Let's use a very simple project such as a cake baking project. Buy ingredients, mix ingredients, start oven, put cake in oven, bacon check-in, ice cake, serve cake. Next, you ask the question, what day are we going to start this project on? You go to your project information tab and you say, okay, I'm going to start this on, let's say the 18th of February, click OK. The moment you do that, you see that Microsoft Project immediately puts your start and finish for all of these tasks because you haven't really set them to the 18th. Now let's say this took multiple days, like one day, two days, another two days, three days, four days, five days, and three days. For example, you can see how it begins moving these bars out to show you the length, and the length really is indicating how long each task is. Going a step further, you can actually link these tasks using the predecessor column. So if you click in this column and you put in the predecessor for task two as being task one, predecessor for task two, or for task three rather as being two, you can see how these are being joined. And you could even say, well, I wanna do these tasks in a start to start relationship so you can put in a three and an SS, and it does that for you. You could say, I want this task to be a start to finish, and it would do that for you as well. So you could put in a full SF, and it would do that for you. But you have to kind of trick the system. Oh, we don't really wanna do that because we don't use start to finish very much, do we? So let's go ahead and put a four in, go ahead and put a five in, and let's go ahead and put in a six and a finish to finish, just to illustrate what this looks like. So that is how you can, in a very simple manner, get a schedule for your project. You don't have to go overboard. It doesn't have to be overkill, and as far as tracking your schedule, Microsoft Project enables you to do that. You might wanna go look for my video, Microsoft Project Lean and Mean, but I talk about how you can build a schedule and track a schedule. It's a very simple process.
But as a project manager, it would be absolutely unforgivable if we did not have a schedule in our top 30 tools and techniques. Let's move on to our next one. Next on the list, we have a rather important one. And this one, as you can see, is titled Cost Baseline and Project Funding Requirements. It states, the planned expenditure of funds over time linked to specific tasks and work packages to give a detailed account of the budget expenditure in total and periodically against which cost performance will be measured. That's quite a long explanation, but it's important that we highlight what exactly this is. It's all of the budget for the project periodically and in total. And the reason why we do that is so that we can actually track our cost performance. So let's take a closer look at that. I'm going to be sharing with you some ideas as to how this could be documented. A lot of people use Excel. Excel could be always a ready tool to be used for this kind of thing. So we could improvise here. And I'll just show you a few fields that could be relevant for anyone who is trying to put this type of thing together. So you could have, first of all, the task, the task name, or WBS component. And after you've got that down, you've got your estimates. You could show hierarchy of a WBS ID to illustrate the component and the tasks under it and your dollar amounts. And you could also have a time period. You could have your start your end dates, that is. And by the time you're done, you're going to get all of the items that need to be done into a succinct total, you see. So when you think about this, you want to make sure you account for the WBS components, If they are WBS components, you want to account for the activities that are linked. And more specifically, if there are any control accounts, these should be linked. You also want the time frame and the milestones to be part of this, just so that you can have a more integrated system to track everything, okay? Now, this is one idea of how this can be tracked. If you use other fancy software, then maybe your fancy software could be used to track your cost baseline. Remember, it's your cost baseline. So we're talking about periodic, the amounts for the periodic or incremental tasks as they're being performed, and you also want the total amount. So there are two things, periodic amounts being spent, total amount being spent. Break it down like this, and it will be a lot easier for you to track. Now, let me show you an example in Microsoft Project, very similar to what I showed you a few seconds ago. And here is that example again in Microsoft Project. Let's take a look at the backpack design project, actually. 
So here is the backpack design project. And you can see in here, we have the different costs for all of the line items. So as I said previously, Microsoft Project is not a bad tool at all for tracking costs. Now I know some people are going to have something to say about that, but I have been fortunate to use Microsoft Project to track costs on previous projects, resource loading, cost loading, the whole nine yards. And I've found that if you know what you're doing and you can scale it up or down, you will not be feeding the monster or be eaten by the monster. And with that, my friends, we have come to the end of our first 10 power tools for the project manager. Remember, a lot of this stuff that I'm sharing with you is from the PMBOK guide, sixth edition. And even if you didn't pick up the sixth edition, other editions also have this stuff. But in episode two, we'll take a look at another 10. And episode three, we'll bring this ship to a final port when we get to the end of all of the 30. So there's a lot more to be covered. If there are any specific tools that you're looking out for, things of interest, why don't you drop us a line and let us know and ensure that those tools of interest will be covered for you. There's a lot more. The lessons learned, registers, the issue of all of that stuff. We're going to be covering that um, as we proceed in this series. All right. So thank you very much for joining us today and look forward to seeing you on the next episode. Thank you. Bye for now.